When you're acting the first one, he's in fact talking about a natural history museum. But not the natural history museum, because that's too mainstream <laughs> corporate for him. <laughs> None of your major label natural history museums for our next staff. No, ladies and gentlemen, he's a proper indie natural history museum fan. He did like the natural history museum long before you were into it. <laughs> and he feels it's jumped the shark now, frankly, now that everyone goes there. Yeah, no. Right, ladies and gentlemen, our final act of the first half, of the first ever museum show is Brian Macker! Thank you very much. Um, oh, so yeah, my name is uh, Brian Macken, and I'm going to talk to you about my mm -hmm. favourite museum, and it's this place, the Natural History Museum in Dublin, or as it's known, as it's been known for generations by Dubliners, the Dead Zoo. <laughs> <laughs> this is a special museum, even in the world of museums, because this place, it's a perfectly preserved specimen of a Victorian cabinet museum. And when I say that, what I mean is you can walk in there today and get the exact same experience as someone did a hundred years ago. The cabinets are the same. The exhibits are the same. Everything is the same. And the reason Ireland and Dublin has this beautiful anachronism in it is a quite an interesting story. And it starts here in Leinster House in Dublin. And if this building looks vaguely familiar, it's because the White House is a carbon copy of it. See? See? <laughs> See? Yeah? Now, by the end of the 19th century, Leinster House was owned by an organisation called the Royal Dublin Society. And they managed to get a grant from Victoria's government to build a natural history museum connected to it. Uh, and they... Uh, uh, did the foundation stone in 1857, this is a, 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 a picture of it, all the best, the, the great and the good came to this event, including uh, Robert Fitzroy, uh, uh, captain of the, the Beagle, uh, uh, Charles Darwin went on, I know, I know, it's interesting, um, and it was built uh, a year later and it's uh, connected there, you can see there's Leicester House uh, and there's the Natural History Museum, and it was hugely popular in its day uh, when it opened. Uh, it had public lectures. The first lecture was by Dr. Livingston. So Dr. Livingston, I presume, that chap. Um, he did the first lecture. They got, uh, in the first few years, 100,000 people a year. And this was in the 1860s, when the population of Dublin was 650,000 total. Okay? You didn't get tourism in those days. Um, so it was immensely popular. Uh, and, and they started to build up their collection in the usual ways, like this, for example, um, uh, was found in a bog and donated to the museum. This is the, it's called the Irish Elk. There's three of them uh, when you walk into the museum. And just to give a sense of scale, from there to there is four metres across. Okay? And there's three of them when you walk in. All right? Uh, we managed to get this. This was shot by King George. <laughs> which is, uh, good for the museum, but probably not that good for the tiger. Um, we got this donated by a, a man in Limerick who found this eel that had swallowed a frog and choked uh, and he posted it to the museum. Um, they brought things, they, the, the Dead Zoo has one of the world's best collection of Blaschka models and if you don't know what Blaschka models is, they are these gorgeous glass models of things which you can't exhibit very easily in museums. They're built by these two uh, glass and yet he doesn't have a lot to do with the museum. Uh, he's famous for being the first Irishman to cross Africa. Uh, he published his diaries as part of it. Um, uh, it was, he was the doctor of the Emin Pasha Relief Expedition, uh, led by uh, Stanley, so the guy who said, Dr. Livingston, I presume, and it was a, an expedition to go and rescue this guy, Emin Pasha, from deepest, dark, darkest Africa. And the reason he looked so pissed off is because it was a disaster. <laughs> Hundreds of their men died on their way, and when they got there, Emin Pasha was fine. <laughs> he did not need any rescuing. But because they'd gone all that way, he threw them a party, and in the party, Emin Pasha got wasted, mistook a window for a balcony, and almost died. And he had to save it. Um, but by about 1910 or thereabouts, the museum uh, sort of settled down to its current form. And I mean exactly the current form. Some of the uh, cabinets have the exact same things inside them. Some of the cabinets haven't been opened since 1915. And 
that's not even a joke. <laughs> they changed the entrances at one point, and one of the new structural supports that they put in blocked the access way to the great ape's cabinet. And now no one can get in. <laughs> you have to smash the window, and no one wants to do that. So, it, And the most annoying part about it is that the arriving time is wrong. <laughs> but it's been wrong for a very long time now. <laughs> so no one wants to change it. And it was doing quite well, it was quite popular, it was keeping up to date, up until about sort of 1910, 1920, and then it stopped. It just pickled, if you like. And the reason why is because there was a new Irish government. And the new Irish government were looking for somewhere to hold the doll, which is the uh, Irish Parliament. And they remembered that the Royal Dublin Society had a lovely lecture hall in their uh, in the Leinster House. And the government also gently reminded the Royal Dublin Society that they, in fact, owned the building and all of the land. And so they kicked the Royal Dublin Society out, closed Leinster House to the public, and took control of the museum. And even though they had some um, muscle on their side. And, <laughs> and this new Irish government weren't that interested in science. They were interested, from a cultural point of view, in history, because that's how you get rebellions off the ground, is by talking about your history. And so the Natural History Museum got enough money to keep ticking over, but never enough money to keep it up to date. And so it stayed the same, completely, exactly the same. I can't really think of a, an appropriate metaphor. <laughs> something really lends itself. What I can think of, is it something... I can... Oh, right, yeah. It's, it, it was pickled and preserved just like the animals inside it. And it stayed that way up until the Celtic tiger. Okay? And um, all of a sudden, the government had money. And they didn't know what to do with it, so they gave some of it to the museum. And they were able to, to clean the place and give it a little paint, and they bought a, 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 a giraffe. Um, <laughs> and they named the giraffe, it was a competition, and it's called Spoticus. Um, oh, you can't read that. And it tweets... So, and they were very helpful when I was coming here to this, give me pictures and stuff. So if you have a Twitter thing, if you could tweet at Spoticus with two Ts, NH, Spoticus NH, and say hello from Museum Show Off, I'd appreciate it. Um, and then, everything was going fine, but in 2006, disaster struck. This uh, staircase in the back of the building collapsed. Okay? There was a whole bunch of teachers on it. Nobody died, but some of them were quite seriously injured, and so the museum was shut. Now, they had this idea then, right? They thought, okay, museum's closed, let's do a little bit of refurbishment. Okay, don't change anything inside it, but let's just add, add on an extra bit on the side of the building, and we can have lifts so that people in wheelchairs can get up to the upper uh, galleries. You can have education space, temporary exhibition space, a cafe. <laughs> but then, then, the bankers ruined everything in a way I don't understand, and all the money disappeared. <laughs> and the museum stayed closed for four years. It didn't open again until 2010. On its opening day, it was packed. There was queues all the way down the road, because Dubliners love the Natural History Museum. Nigel Monaghan, the uh, curator uh, of the museum, the keeper of the museum, uh, he told me when the refurbishments were still on the cards that he got every day tons of messages from Dubliners saying, dear God, don't change it. We love it so much, because they understand that the value of this approach. I know we've come very far since Victorian era in, in learning how to engage audiences, but how they did it, the Victorians, was they said, right, we want to inspire people, so we will show them just the variation and the wonder. So we have a cabinet, we are going to fit it with as much stuff as we can. When you do that, you can show how things that look this, look different are, slight, are actually exactly the same. You can show so that people can have a good look at something that's quite ordinary, or, or something that's really quite odd, or, or something that's quite stupid looking. <laughs> or, or, or you get to see underneath things, or, or you get to have a good close look at something you see every day, or something you really wouldn't want to see every day. <laughs> so it's for that reason that I really hope that the Dead Zoo stays exactly the same for generations and generations to come. So please, go visit it and buy something from the shop. <laughs> <laughs>